Welcome to Pavant Butte in the Black Rock Desert of, I guess, West Central Utah between the towns of Delta and Milford. Thanks for joining me. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey out here exploring some of the great geologic scenes and sites in uh, this part of Utah. We've got another volcano here, it looks like, uh, so I'm pretty excited. This one has some similarities to others we've looked at and investigated, but looks also a little bit different. I think what we'll do here is uh, talk about it for a second, maybe do an overview with Google Earth, and then we'll head up top to uh, the top of the volcano, see what evidence we can collect there. Pavant Butte is a real distinct landmark in this part of Utah, rising some 740 feet or so above the surrounding area. Uh, from, even from this distance, we can see some distinct features. We can see uh, the obvious uh, beige, kind of pink colored, outcrops up there that we'll want to take a good look at. We can also see some distinct bedding over here on the left or west side of the volcano. And then what's kind of striking, uh, getting my attention here, there's a definite bench up here. This volcano has um, a nice bench just about right here. And so let's go check these things out first using Google Earth, and then we'll head up to the top to investigate it a little bit more closely. Okay, we've driven the kind of squirrely road up to near the summit of Pavant Butte. The true summit's over here to the north, um, but here we're looking to the west down into the eruptive crater. We can see those, those pinkish beige beds over there. We'll hike over there in a second and give those another look. Uh, but wow, what a vantage point from up here on Pavant Butte. You get a great uh, nearly 360 degree look. There's kind of the north there. Uh, if we come over here above the trees, I believe this is the canyon range, looking to the east. Um, just great viewpoints in all directions. What we can look at here is we can look at the ground and see that a lot of the ground is made of very dark rocks. And we know these rocks, these are basalts. Um, but what's a little different here is the basalts are mainly composed of these beds of basaltic ash. You can see all these little clumps of basalt in here uh, that are glued together. So that lets us know that this was an explosive eruption, at least it partially, that at some point the lava was being fragmented, thrown into the air, or it accumulated around the vent and was um, glued together either by heat or other minerals in it. So it's glued together. So we could call this a basaltic tuff because it's mainly ash particles and the composition is basalt. Uh, we can see this little bench here and the one just above it right here are dipping uh, away from our view gently. Um, so this is probably the outer eastern edge of the volcano dipping out in that direction. As we swing around and look to uh, the north, we see kind of an interesting um, display in the bedding here. We can see that the beds on the outer flank of the rim of the volcano are dipping to the right, uh, to the east, in that direction, and those on the inside and towards the crater are dipping back in towards the crater. And that's a characteristic pattern we see in a lot of volcanoes is um, the inward dip into the craters. So if particles uh, don't have the energy to get thrown outside the, the crater or the vent, uh, they end up sort of slumping or settling down towards the inner part and forming that inward dip there. So since we've demonstrated that this volcano is explosive, 
we know that basaltic lavas and basalt volcanoes tend to be fairly benign. They tend to erupt lava. They don't tend to erupt a lot of ash. Um, and so that really demands that we figure out where the water source is. If this volcano is going to erupt explosively, that usually involves some sort of interaction of the magma with water. Now we're up pretty high, um, high enough that I don't think groundwater would be a big factor here. But it turns out the key to this riddle lies in the age of this eruption. This volcano erupted uh, about 15,000 years ago. So about 15,000 years ago, what was happening in this portion of Utah? And we get a sense of that, some clues, as we look off to the west. You might see some white lines out there. Those are lake beds. So those are uh, salty lake beds and playas that are left over from when this area was covered by a huge freshwater lake known as Lake Bonneville. And so this eruption took place under Lake Bonneville. What's more, at the time the eruption of Pavant Butte, Butte takes place, the uh, high stand or the depth or the extent of Lake Bonneville, excuse me, was near its all time high. At 15,000 years ago, it's uh, pretty close to its all time high stand. And so it would have been um, almost a thousand feet deep at its deepest when. Uh, it erupted. So as this rising magma, this basaltic magma, encounters the lake, it becomes explosive. It fragments all the material. Here's another great view of some of the, uh, the tuff and the particles thrown out of the volcano, kind of glued together. Um, so, sorry, where was I? Yeah, so this thing erupts under Lake Bonneville starts to pile up volcanic material, ash, uh, but it's under the water, right? So it's completely saturated, probably slumping and sliding a little bit, not really building up a, a tall, steep cone until it's able to get near the top uh, of the water, of the lake at that point, and then it starts erupting and throwing stuff into the air and collecting around the vent to form something that event, eventually sticks up above the lake level. And all this has been figured out by smarter people than me, uh, so let's rely on some of their expertise here to maybe piece this together. Uh, there's a nice paper I found, a journal article from 2001 that nicely summarizes the observations at Pavant Butte and then puts together a nice detailed summary of the eruptive sequence. And so let me give you the, the reference first in case you're interested. Um, this is called Eruption and Reshaping of Pavant Butte in Pleistocene Lake Bonneville by J.D.L. White, Geology Department, University of Otago, New Zealand. So shout out to Mr. and Mrs. White for their great work here uh, in Utah, all the way from New Zealand. And in particular, let's start with this diagram that I think nicely illustrates the eruptive sequence. So let's start with this one here. This is the beginning stages of the eruption. So this is the eruption occurring under about 80 or so meters of water. Um, so yeah, 250 or so feet of water. And at this point in the eruption, um, because there's so much water on top of it, it's just building up these low mounds of, of water saturated ash and tephra. Um, so it's not emerging, even though some, some explosions might be throwing stuff into the air, it's all still settling down below the water or the lake level at that point. Um, eventually though, as this material conti continues to build, um, the eruption can progresses to this level. Now there's still full water lava interaction, and so it becomes very explosive, and now it starts building up even more material. Uh, for reference, this line here is the, the lake level at the time. And so it starts building up these big jets 
kind of rooster tails of tephra and debris getting blown out of the, vol of the volcano, of the vent, and accumulating uh, around the slopes. And then eventually, as it continues to build, we go to this final stage here um, where there's less access to water. So now the eruption um, is not quite as explosive. So it's interacting with water, but maybe some of it's sealed off. Maybe the vent sealed off from some of the lake water. Of course, it's built up to above the lake level at this point. Um, and so even though it's producing some ash and tephra, um, it's not nearly as explosive and energetic as it was in that middle stage. And so this is a nice little summary here um, of the eruptive sequence. So pretty amazing uh, that we get this, this eruption of a volcano underneath Lake Bonneville, which is pretty fantastic to think about. This region of uh, central Utah, west central Utah, has other volcanic vents as well. There's um, Tabernacle Hill. Um, oh boy, what are some of the other names? Uh, I think there's one called Fumarole Butte. Um, there's several. You, we could look those up, but there's several of these. And of course, all of these volcanic vents are in response to basin and range extension. So as these mountains have risen over the last 17 or so million years, and the crust has been thinned by the east-west extension, which has produced this topography, in places that thinning of the crust has initiated magma generation, and that magma has risen to the surface uh, to create these volcanoes. This one's just really uh, interesting because it's erupting underneath this huge freshwater lake that exists at that time. Um, these outcrops out here are really quite exquisite. Um, just some of these particles just glued together. And this stuff's really pretty well cemented, I'd say, in terms of its overall hardness. You can see some of these nice, there's a nice vesicular piece of basalt here, a little cinder, uh, all glued together. Um, well, now that we know that this is a hydrovolcanic feature, or what we also have called in other videos a phreatomagmatic eruption, um, we can probably take a good guess at those orange deposits we see just up ahead. We know from other videos and other places we've looked at this material that when lava uh, is interacting with water, those ash particles become quenched. There's an alteration of the volcanic glass that takes place where it produces this material called pelagonite. And that pelagonite is often this kind of orange color, like what we see up ahead. And so a good chance, we're seeing a little bit of it here, uh, even in some of these. There's a nice exposure of it right here a little bit of the more pelagonite rich alteration in these bedded tufts. Um, again, the, the dip of the units right here, dipping slightly to your left, which is into the crater. And presumably, if we come over here towards the outer rim, we'll see a big change. Let's see if I can get down through this section. Not the easiest walking place here. Yeah, big cut here. And right, just as we suspected, now the beds are dipping down the outside of, of the cone. Uh, in terms of classification, as you looked at this on Google Earth, this volcano is, I believe it's a tough cone because of its uh, steepness and height. I have to double check that. I don't think it's a tough ring. I think it's a tough cone. But pretty remarkable and definitely an interesting landmark here. It's also worth mentioning, although it's a little hard to tell from here, but maybe go back to your Google Earth view and look at this pronounced bench along the flank of the volcano. And if you know a little bit about Lake Bonneville, you know that it had a catastrophic flood um, and then that dropped the lake level down about 400 feet 
And so some of these benches on the sides of Pavant Butte are some of those Bonneville shorelines that existed as the lake dropped following the flood uh, and then subsequently dropped even further. Remember that while this thing was sticking up in ancient Lake Bonneville, it would have been pummeled, just absolutely pounded by waves uh, that would have been kicked up by the wind moving across this lake. And so some of these shorelines we see are terraces from when the lake was stable and the wave action was cutting into the sides of Pavant Butte.